So I thought I'd start today by talking a little bit about how um, I see the direction of, of computing changing as we go forward. Um, but to put that in context, I thought I'd start from the beginning and see where we've been. So in the beginning, there was a computer. Um, this computer uh, was only accessible to a government. Um, it took up an entire room, and uh, apparently you needed to, use a, uh, needed to wear a suit in order to, uh, to change the vacuum tubes that were part of it. Um, over the next decade, oh, that's a crazy, uh, I love the neon highlights there, that's awesome. So over the next decade, uh, computers uh, uh, shrunk to only, only take up half a room. Uh, we started putting geniuses in front of the computers. This is actually one of my favorite uh, photos in all of computing. This is Kernigan and Ritchie working at Bell Labs on a PDP-11. All that stuff's classic. But then they also, I, always, I love to imagine that they're um, inventing the C language here. So, um, you know, over, you know, obviously a lot of us know the story from here. Uh, computers got smaller, they got faster. Um, they, uh, we extended the reach out to, you know, first all the workers in, the, in corporations and then everybody at their house. We've got started to be able to take computers, you know, with us, you know, between different places. Um, and then, you know, the revolution happened, and then basically we have computers with us at all the time. So, um, uh, you know, from there, I think, you know, it's not really clear what the next step is. But I know that, you know, every, the, the clear trajectory here is that computing is getting smaller, more pervasive. Um, and so kind of the current meme in the industry is that, you know, we're going to wear something on our wrist, or we're going to have a monitor in front of our eyes all the time. But... I'm here today because I really believe these are the next computing devices that we're going to be working with as, um, you know, as part of the internet. Um, these are the things that are in our day-to-day day -day lives that we know and love already. And this fundamentally, in my opinion, changes the direction that computing is headed. These don't have screens. They don't have way, any way of uh, entering text like the previous devices. Um, there's already established conventions for how most of them work. And so we really need to reconsider how we do, you know, how, how we build applications uh, for these things. The, obviously, applications are not going to run on your doorbell. It's going to run somewhere between your doorbell and the other devices in your life. And I think a great example of the promise that we have with this kind of new paradigm for computing is a Kickstarter project I saw called the Good Night Light. Um, and so what this is, is it's just a light, but it has a twist. Um, so you purchase two of these lights, and you give one of these lights to one of your loved ones or one of your friends. And then on the top, you can you know, just barely see it, there's a little chimney that is a, that's a button. Um, and what happens is that when you press the button, it doesn't turn on your light, but it turns on the light of your loved one. Um, and so it's a way of communicating that you're thinking about somebody over a large distance. And I think this is a great example of how we've taken something that's very ordinary, a light, and we've made it better using connectivity. Um, open hardware and just the, the, uh, the immense speed at which hardware is getting cheap is putting projects like this um, in both the, the range of, of us as developers and then also um, it makes it you know, practical from an expense perspective. This is the Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, it's an incredibly capable device, incredibly inexpensive. Um, it has you know, 512 megs of RAM, which is just incredible for the, the cost of it. Um, it has uh, uh, general purpose I.O. pins up there in the, in the right that allow you to interface it with hardware. Um, and it's just one of many types of hardware uh, like this that are available today. This is a Tessel. Um, this was another really successful recent Kickstarter project. Um, this can run JavaScript. Um, it doesn't run it natively, but you, you write the applications for it in JavaScript. And again, you can control all kinds of hardware. Um, and this also you know, runs on a small enough processor that it's actually feasible for battery-operated devices. Um, so it, there's really no, it, it's incredibly easy now to, 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 uh, to build, you know, projects using, uh, using hardware. Um, uh, but the thing is, when you start to, to, to look at making this real, it's hard. Um, so previously, as, as David mentioned, I worked at a startup called Nest Labs. Um, Nest Labs, uh, for those of you, many of you probably don't know it, um, because it's the United States' only product right now, um, builds a connected thermostat. Um, and so this thermostat you can control from your phone, you can control it from the web. Um, it's kind of the thermostat re-envisioned for the internet era, connected thermostat. Um, and so while it's easy to build these hardware projects using great, the, the, you know, pretty rich ecosystem we have um, in JavaScript, Johnny5, and all these other libraries that have, that have evolved, um, when you go to do it uh, for real, it's really difficult. And in fact, there's a, there's a set of problems that you have to solve before you can really do a real product. Um, 
So the downside about all these things being uh, in, our, you know, in our lives and, and being connected with, with computation is that the, the stakes are a lot higher. So if you think about the thermostat, um, someone being able to hack your thermostat has not only a, you know, a, a, a inconvenience or a financial, uh, you know, potential ad impact like somebody hacking your computer, but it could potentially be life-threatening. Life um, they could lower your temperature to zero and hold it there. Um, they, you know, all kinds of bad things could happen. And so when you build one of these projects, you have to cover, uh, you have to think of security up front. Um, you have to go through all the work of doing authorization, um, no, authentication, authorization, um, and then you usually want to make sure that you can do device control. So real-time device control, you can control this device um, in the field. And all you have to do all of this stuff, including monitoring, before you can really start in on the project. You know, what you really, the, the problem you're really attacking at the beginning. Um, and so as David mentions, I work, uh, you know, I work at Microsoft and I work with a number of companies in our, our accelerators around the world. Um, and so one is working on a, a project to um, add smarts to everyday things. Um, another one's uh, doing something similar but completely different. They want to make the factory floors more efficient. Um, and working with both these companies, I realized that they really had the, this, 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 those set of problems that they had to tackle before they could even start tackling these problems. And that led me to start a project called Nitrogen. Um, and so Nitrogen is a, a project to, um, to, to tackle these, 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 this, this kind of um, uh, table stakes type pro things you have to solve, authentication, authorization. Um, and it's named Nitrogen because I believe that the future of computing is pervasive and will, it, it will be inside of everything that we do, just like the gases in our atmosphere. Um, and so, uh, and, and finally, it's, a, it's a Apache 2 license so that people can, um, uh, those, those two, two accelerator companies and anybody that's interested in the community can embed it in their, uh, in their, in their, in their products or, their, or run their own service. Um, and so the best way I thought to, to, to run through and get a kind of a feel for how it works is to, is to talk about uh, a, a real practical project. And um, uh, in particular, I thought it would be great to build an internet-connected light like that, that good, good night light that I mentioned before. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to explain is, is about nitrogen is, a, is at its core, it's an authorized and um, uh, authenticated and authorized message passing system. And so devices communicate both between themselves and with applications over messages. Um, and so in this case, I have, I'm, using, I'm gonna use two messages to, to talk with my lamp. Um, I'm gonna use a switch command, um, which is a type of message, um, and, and, and that basically tells the lamp what state it should be in. Should it be on, should it be off, um, and, and the switch or the light should act uh, uh, appropriately. Likewise, the lamp should send back status with a switch status uh, message that tells you whether or not it's on and off uh, in response to that message. So you have a feeling for or you understand what the current state is of the system. Um, and so I built this last week. Um, I, I, I didn't actually uh, electrocute myself. Um, I, I am not a professional electrical engineer. Um, and so what I, bought, I, I built is I have an electrical socket. Um, it's connected up to a relay. Um, so the big black box is essentially an electrical switch that switches on when I uh, connect 5 volts or digital 1 to the center blue pin there. Um, it turns off when it, with any other state. So when you take the voltage off, it, it, drops, it, 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 it opens the circuit, so you have no power. Um, and uh, so the Raspberry Pi has a set of, um, as I mentioned, general purpose I.O. pins that you can use to drive this. And so what I've set up in my house back in California, because I wasn't uh, brave enough to drag this all the way to Portugal and have it potentially stolen from, the, from me by the TSA in the United States, um, is, uh, uh, is this hooked up to a light. And uh, 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 I'm going to quickly show you, hopefully... Oops, does that work? Yeah, okay. I'm going to quickly show you what, what, the, what the code looks like, and then, and then I'll show you a demo, hopefully. Um, uh, so there's basically three points to this. So what, what this is is the, the code that's running on that Raspberry Pi. Um, it's running in a node container, um, uh, and there's basically three, three big uh, sections to this. Um, the first is there's a, there's a concept of a service, and that's what this device is connecting to. So it's connecting to a nitrogen service that's running in the cloud in this case. Um, and then I'm attaching, I'm going to attach to that service a, a device. And in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm modeling my light, um, probably not unsurprisingly, as, as a switch device. Um, and, I, and you can see that because I'm using a GPIO pin uh, uh, 
uh, uh, module that I wrote that, it, that controls that, that pin based on commands that you receive through nitrogen. Um, it exposes that it can take in switch commands, and we'll see how that, that helps us later. Um, and then I connect it to the service. Um, and so this, this line here on line 22, the connection covers all of that ugly, you know, all the ugly problems that I described on that one slide. It uh, authenticates the device with the service. If the, the, the device has never been seen by the service before, it provisions that device, um, which means that it generates um, authentication uh, credentials for that device and sends it down to the device. The device stores that in a level to be locally. Um, and then after you've finished authentication, it actually establishes a session as well. So this is the access tokens that you use to work with the service to make sure everything's uh, uh, protected. And it also establishes a real-time connection, so we have device control. Um, and the final thing that it does is it sets up uh, 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 what's called a, a, a command manager, in this case a switch manager, that basically watches the stream of messages coming to this device. One way you can think of nitrogen is it's sort of like Twitter for devices. So this device is receiving a stream of messages, um, and the switch manager's role is to look at that current state, which is uh, timestamp, so it knows what order everything came in, and figure out which commands have not been executed yet, and then execute those. And so this, this thing's role is to say, oh, I haven't, I haven't executed this very last one that asked me to turn on the light, and executes it against the light device that I'm passing into it. Um, so I know that's like an incredibly like whirlwind, fast, uh, fast tour of this. Um, there's more details I have at the end uh, on the site, and I actually wrote a blog entry on how it works. Um, but I also wrote a really simple administration tool for this. Um, I mean, really simple. This is, this is almost embarrassing for me to show. Um, it's an Ember.js app, um, uh, but basically this shows you your fleet. You know, your, I call it the fleet, device fleet. Um, and this is all the, all the things I have attached in my house. Um, so I actually attached also a, uh, a camera looking at this, um, uh, looking at this, uh, looking at this light, um, and it follows a similar semantic. You send it a command. So I'm going to ask it right now to take a, a snapshot of my living room, and hopefully it works. Uh, uh, and so we see that, um, and it makes me jet lag just looking at this. And it's very dark in California right now. Um, and so now I'm going to switch back over to the the light itself. Um, and you see that here, you can almost see it, uh, it's kind of cut off, but because we expose that it has a switch command capability, we give it a, a very simple UI for running, uh, to, for executing those messages. So if I hit toggle here, it's going to send down a, um, a, a switch command that tells the light to turn on, um, and the light has responded and said, hey, I'm on. So now if we switch back to the, the camera that's facing that, that light, um, and we take another snapshot, uh, we should, if inner gods are with me, should see it on. Uh, it's a little underexposed, but the light is on um, in California. <laughs> Thank God. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quickly, uh, before I get another call, before I get the out-of-band uh, uh, status message from my wife that that is on, I'm going to turn that off. Um, okay. All right. So I've turned it off. It's responded back. Hey, I'm off. Um, okay, um, so that's kind of a quick kind of overview of how, how nitrogen works. Um, uh, I'm going to switch back. All right, great. Um, demo did that. And so, you know, if you think about this, um, that's, that's pretty neat. You have, so you have device control. We've covered all of the really ugly, painful things that you have to do as part of building one of these devices. But if you think about the, the feed that this builds up, it's actually even more interesting. And so what we've learned here is um, one thing I didn't mention is I actually built a button that controls this as well. Um, and so instead of having a light switch now, we have a button that we push that essentially turns on and off the lamp. And if you think about this stream that it's building up, it's actually really interesting from a, uh, what can you build from this uh, perspective. So the next thing I'm going to do is build a, a vacation app that essentially can replicate my light, light usage when I'm gone for security purposes. So people think I'm at home uh, even when I'm not. Um, and that's a good example of why building up a message stream like this is, is important. So um, it keeps devices and applications at a distance from each other uh, with a set of abstractions that they can both understand and, and use to control without having to know the intimate details of either. Um, 
And so that's what I currently have with the project. So if you go to the project, that, all that stuff works. It's all available. Um, it is point one, so it is early, but these two companies are using it in their, in their pilot projects. But I wanted to talk about what I think the Internet of Things needs from a kind of a higher level perspective. Um, uh, so right now, and one reason I'm building nitrogen is when I went out to kind of find, you know, try to help these companies find something like this, all I could find were centralized services. And I think this is really dangerous from two perspectives. Um, the first one is a little more benign, um, and, it, and that is that uh, that's not a, 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 a solution that's going to work from a latency perspective for some, for some applications. Um, for the factory floor in particular, you have operations that you want to you know, be able to round trip a, a command within 10 to 15 milliseconds. That's just not possible from a speed of light perspective um, with a centralized service that's going all the way to you know, the West Coast or the East Coast in the United States or you know, wherever in Europe. So um, the second thing, and even more important, is that this gives up a lot of our privacy. We start thinking about everything in our house having, um, ha having the ability to, to, to track essentially what we're doing. It's not acceptable, in my opinion, that we send all this stuff up to the cloud. Um, instead, what I think is the, the right, right solution is to have a distributed system. Um, one where we decide what gets to be sent up to the cloud, and we authorize that, but most decisions are made locally. And so in the context of a home, all these decisions we made maybe in the gateway or um, in, in, in the context of a, of a company, um, they're made inside the company. Um, this is a hard problem. So you know, one of the reasons I came here to speak is I'd love to get feedback from people on if anybody has worked on a partial trust distributed system like this, I would love to talk to you. Please find me. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's one of the things we want to do. The second is I want to, I want to uh, extend out. So the, the current, um, there's no reason that you couldn't work from it from an Arduino, but the current client library is, is node-based, um, and that doesn't, you know, that doesn't lend itself to really low-end devices. And so I want to extend this out to, to low-end devices. And I have some ideas on how to do that using some you know, things that seem to be evolving or um, being established in the industry, uh, you know, MQTT in particular, um, to extend it out to these smaller devices. Um, uh, uh, but also there's a number of problems around connectivity, in, in particular really infrequent connectivity because these, these devices are, are built on batteries, right? Um, and, the, and the expectation for a lot of these is you can run them on a battery for two years. Um, so one of the things that I want to do is, is make, it, make the, the, the framework uh, amenable for, for these types of situations. Um, and then finally, um, uh, this is a really extreme example, but some devices, uh, or basically all these devices, are, are out, out somewhere where they're typically inaccessible. This is actually a, uh, a climate device that sits in Antarctica and, and records climate and information for kind of working on global warming. Um, this is an extreme example, but obviously it, it'd be very difficult to go out and stick a USB cord in this and upgrade it. And also the scale of the Internet of Things will make this very difficult in general. Um, you can't, you can't you know, in contrast to the way we do through things today, you can't uh, do a, an iOS uh, upgrade on every device that you own in your house. Um, we'll go crazy because it'll be 10 to 100 times more devices. And so instead, this needs to be managed and managed completely silently by uh, whatever framework emerges in this space. Um, so this is something that I want to build and add into nitrogen as well. Um, yeah, so um, how do you get started? I, uh, the project's on GitHub. It's under nitrogen.js. Um, uh, the service, uh, you can run yourself. Um, I also have a hosted service at api.nitrogen.io. And on my blog, I have a, a walkthrough of how I've done that, that LAMP. Um, uh, and, you know, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening to my, uh, my, my crazy science project, and uh, I look forward to talking to everybody about it. Thanks. Thank you.